Um, I, I will let Ruby uh, introduce herself and give her, her bio so that you can get to know her a little better. Um, but today's event um, is, is um, given to us by an HR uh, professional at Architerix. And uh, she is also, Ruby is also building a career in coaching for whoever is interested. I think coaching is very good for those who, uh, who need to feel a little help for their career path. Um, so yeah, basically I'll, I'll just let you get started, Ruby, and you can, um, you can lead us. Uh, well, um, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Ruby. I, um, well, my actual name is Rabia, but I go by Ruby here. So if you call me by Rabia or Ruby, I will answer to both of those. Um, I currently work at Arcteryx. Um, I work out of our manufacturing facility in New Westminster. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, Arcteryx uh, manufactures um, gear and clothing for outdoor sports, um, such as skiing, ice climbing. Um, and like Anna mentioned, um, I'm also training to become a empowerment coach. Um, so very happy to be here. Thank you so much, um, Anna and Senda for having me and uh, also all of you here who've taken this time out to um, hear what employers want. Um, seems like a very interesting question. I, from what I understand, there's people on the call here who are either graduating or who may have had some experience in the past um, or who might be international students here. So before we um, you know, dive into the presentation, I will give a brief um, introduction as to where my HR background is um, had started. Um, I work at Arcteryx now, but previously I worked, um, I've been working in HR for around eight years now. So um, my career in HR really started uh, when I was working as a management trainee back in Pakistan, where I'm originally from. And um, I was into a leadership development program, which in some places might be called a management trainee program. And uh, I was sort of being sent around to different departments to see where my skill set would m match the best. And um, I expressed interest in human resources because I was very um, drawn to being able to speaking to people and uh, being involved uh, in their day to day as human beings, uh, much more than something like marketing or sales. So I got an opportunity to work with the then HR business partner at the time. And you know, from then onwards, I was like, this is what I want to do. And then I went to get a degree. So I got an MBA in human resource and organizational leadership. And now I'm working in Canada in human resources. So that's a little bit about my journey into human resources. And to start us off, I do want to acknowledge that I am an immigrant and settler uh, on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salewith Tooth First Nations. And I acknowledge the traditional guardianship of the past, current, and future elders uh, of these lands. So as you are attending this workshop, I invite and encourage you uh, as either international students or um, Canadians to uh, think around your uh, connection to the land you're on today and what that has uh, made it possible.
Oh, I guess we're, I guess we had some technical issues here. Um, I didn't know if it was just for me. Yeah, I think it's for, I, I can't see her either. Oh, uh, maybe she had an internet connection problem. Oh, there she is. Yeah, she's still on here. Oh, all right. So it looks like I lost internet connection. So I will go back to sharing my screen with all of you. Wonderful technology. All right, let's see here if I can set it up again. Uh, okay, let's run into, all right, here we go. Are you folks able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, um, as somebody who might be already either a seasoned professional or who might be thinking of graduating from school or who might be, you know, who might have just started their journey in school, um, a very important question to ask and that, I, that I've heard a lot in my journey when I Oh, I think, yeah, I think we're having some internet issues. Um, maybe let's just give a few seconds until we can come back. Sorry, everyone. Technology. I think, let's see, she's still on here. So I think she just lost connection. Hello. Hi. Ah. Hello. Can you folks hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what's going on with the with the internet connection. Let me see if I can connect to my data. It might actually be more stable. And I don't know if it's on my side or your side. Don't we love technology? <laughs> yeah, when it works, it's grand, isn't it? <laughs> Well, uh, we'll try and go again to see. Okay, we'll try again. Are you folks able to, I guess, not see my screen? Mm -hmm. so not yet. Okay, let's go. Attempt number three. <laughs> okay. So uh, in my experience, I've come across some common answers and I've come across some prepared answers. And I do want to say that there's nothing wrong with these answers. Uh, the only reason why I'm highlighting them is so that as, uh, as people who want to uh, step out into the careers and into the corporate world, um, I would like you to think about uh, if these are the answers you would like to give yourself or hear from, uh, or is there something more? So uh, some common answers that, you know, I hear, uh, I've heard people say is, you know, I want a job just, just pays the bills, really. Um, I want a job that will get me any sort of experience, as long as it's experience. Um, I'll just go with the flow. Um, and, or, you know, some people might say, I want to go somewhere prestigious. Uh, or some people might say um, somewhere with high salary and perks. And again, there's absolutely no wrong answers here because it is all dependent on your personal situation. Um, some prepared answers that students uh, typically, um, you know, are encouraged to prepare for and also say in the interviews uh, can be something around, I want a job where I can grow or learn. 
Um, I want a job where I can use my education and skills. Um, and I want a job basically where I can achieve X, Y, Z. Um, and for me, you know, that is a definition that fulfills a definition of success. So having presented these um, answers that I've come across, I mean, I've said these answers uh, multiple times throughout my career as well. Um, so again, there's, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, what I would like you to do in the next slide is having had a chance to go through these, uh, think for yourself for a minute um, while you're with us on the call, what kind of job are you looking for? And so on this screen, um, here's where the cell phones come in. So on your phones, you can go to menti.com and I believe you can, um, oh, there we go. You can uh, use the code 5918510 and put in an answer. So the answers are completely anonymous. Um, I also understand that not everybody is comfortable speaking uh, on Zoom. So this is a great way for participation and it's anonymous. So yeah, let's hear what do people look for in uh, their work? We've got 20, 35 folks on the call. So, oh, wow, now they're rolling in. Benefits, yes. Mm -hmm. Money, very honest. <laughs> I like that. Purpose, teamwork, fulfillment, absolutely. Maybe we'll give it 30 more seconds for people to put in some more answers if they want to. Oops, sorry about that. Work-life balance. Hmm. Work with people, somebody said in the chat. Networking, to be comfortable. Nice coworkers knowledge, achievement, fellowship. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, excellent answers. I will move from the slide. Um, the reason again why I asked this question is for you to be in a curious stage of mind. Um, just because I work in an HR profession or just because um, you're studying somewhere or you are interacting with a family member who may have had a career um, those answers are great to have uh, as information. Uh, what I really wanted to do with this exercise is invite you to be curious about what is important to you. So for some people, growth is important. For some people, satisfaction, money, um, purpose, uh, challenging, fulfillment, um, good paying job, all of those things are important. And um, as long as you know that is what fulfills you, uh, those are great answers to have. So moving on to what employers want or the quality, rather, you know, what qualities do employers look for? I would say, if my slide will move ahead. Uh, okay, let's see here. Looks like I'd have to move the slide ahead by hand. Okay, let's see if we can set it up again. Okay, there we go. Thank you folks can see it. All right. So what are the qualities that employers value? And um, if you notice, the first thing that I've put here is as an employee, know what you want um, and also are curious. So employers definitely are not looking for somebody who might be a know-it-all 
or thinks you know they have all the answers to everything because that would beat the purpose of collaboration and teamwork uh, that we value uh, as an employer but it is very important when you uh, walk into either an interview or even after you've had a job um, to really know if if that is the work that will light you up if that is the work that you want to get experience in, if that is the work that you want to learn, uh, if that is the work that you will be wanting to spend, you know, eight hours, nine hours a day, sometimes even more um, if your job demands it. So when you either go for an interview or you're working in the workplace, it is always helpful to know what it is that you want and I can appreciate that as a fresh graduate or as somebody who is still in school, this might not be the easiest to answer. Uh, a lot of people say, I'm not really sure what I want. I'm just, you know, experiencing different things, um, which is where we really, as um, somebody in the human resources field, encourage, or I would encourage, um, there are multiple avenues to approach this question. Uh, it's not simply that you have to graduate or be in the workforce to answer this question for yourself. Um, you can answer this question through internships. You can answer this question through volunteer work. You can answer this question um, based on really what your hobbies and passions are. You might be studying something, but your passions or hobbies might point you in another direction. And you know, you've all heard several stories. I don't need to repeat it. People will, you know, uh, take up a job, find that they're not really satisfied, uh, and then they'll leave and do something that they're passionate about. So going into the workplace, um, it does not have to be all doom and gloom, and you don't necessarily have to leave the workplace um, to pursue what you're passionate about. If you can find uh, the time to be curious while you're still in school, or if you've just graduated to really understand what you want and be curious about that, that will take you a long way in building a fulfilled career life. Uh, we all need to work. Uh, we're all human beings. And so uh, it's important to know that. So the other things that employers, and if employers can see that, they and if you have like an organization uh, where you do get the opportunity to express that interest. Um, for me, for example, I expressed an interest in coaching. So I had a conversation with my manager uh, where I was like, you know, this is what I like to do. And is there an opportunity in the organization to build on this? Uh, and turns out there was an opportunity in the learning and development um, team where they are uh, looking to introduce coaching for managers. And so when I was able to articulate that, uh, I was able to get that opportunity. So when you know what you want, you can ask for it. That's the bottom line. Um, the other thing that employers value is built on their experience in the future. So for a lot of us, when we go into the interview, uh, we want to tell employers or recruiters everything that is already on our resume. You know, I delivered 500% in sales. Excellent. I built a diversity and inclusion program. Excellent. Employers want to hear about that. And what will help you really um, nail that you've really understood the organization and you understand their pain point is if you can say, I built a diversity and inclusion program in Pakistan and I want to know what your diversity and inclusion problems are if you're interviewing for a diversity and inclusion role, for example. So the, the key is how do you not stop at I, you know, built a diversity and inclusion program. How do you say I built a diversity and inclusion program and here's how I can build it for you? Or I hear this is your problem and based on my experience, this is what I can do for you, right? So it's like, um, how are you bridging that gap for the employer based on your experience? I hope that makes sense. Um, the third thing that employers value is uh, somebody who knows their strengths 
or is willing to learn. So the great thing about um, working in an organization is that you, especially if you work for a really good one, is that you get opportunities for learning and development. And so it's really important to know where your strengths are. A lot of people, I personally believe in strengths-based approach. So a lot of people focus too much on where they're weak at. Again, in saying this, please keep in mind, I am not asking you to dismiss your weaknesses or say that, you know, I'm not going to pay attention to them if they are critical uh, in some way to your work or your job. Um, you should be spending some time on them. But where you'll really excel at is if you build on your strengths. So if you are a great um, public speaker um, and you know not such a great copywriter, if you take a communications job and be like, I'm going to be a super you know, person who's going to write the best copy that anyone has ever seen, chances are you'll probably get there, but it'll be super painful versus if you say, you know, I, I love public speaking and how can I facilitate a training for your team? Uh, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to shine there. People will notice what you have um, to offer. You know, when you walk into a workplace, people are always assessing you or asking you or want to know uh, in one way or the other, what can you offer, not what you can't offer. <laughs> so um, when you're able to pinpoint your strengths, when you know your strengths or you're willing to learn about strengths, um, it'll take you a long way uh, in the workplace. And personally, there is no, even as a fresh graduate, or even as somebody who might be a new uh, professional in Canada, if you've not had the opportunity to take an assessment, organizations love assessments, um, side note. <laughs> um, if you, you've not had the opportunity to, to take any, uh, ask your manager, ask your human resource department if there is a assessment that you that they sort of, you know, uh, give their employees or if there's one that you could take. Uh, that's a great way to know your strengths as well. Um, the fourth thing that employers really value um, is don't take failure personally. Um, and this is a very uh, this is something that comes to mindset for a lot of us. Um, for a lot of us, we may have grown up in cultures, we may have grown up in academic institutions where failure is um, considered bad, I would say. Um, and so it kind of, in the workplace, you will fail. There is no, um, no guarantees, no one will say that, you know, you walk into the workplace and you'll never fail. Workplaces are not a 4.0 grade point average. Um, you will fail. Uh, and what people will look for you in that moment is how you can recover gracefully from failure. Um, if you are willing to innovate, if you're willing to fail if you're learning if you're willing to learn from that failure and not get sucked by that failure um, that is something that organizations look for they value there are some organizations whose cultures like entire companies are built on uh, championing failure they think failure is critical to success you can be successful without failing first so the less personally you can take it um, and the faster you can recover from it, um, the farther you can, uh, the more value you can offer to the organization because you will be seen as somebody who is a risk taker. Uh, and again, this might not be for everybody. So everything that I'm saying here, please uh, always check in with yourself if, you know, this makes sense for you or not, right? So uh, people who generally are more risk takers, um, have a, a, you know, people come to them and look up to them uh, to take them out of the rut if they are failing at something. Or they say that, you know, um, maybe 
I don't know, Laura, for example, on the call is uh, somebody who we can reach out to because she's, you know, had experience with failure and she recovered gracefully. So, you know, how, how can we learn from that? Um, and the fifth thing that employers uh, value deeply, greatly, and not just employers, your colleagues, your peers, and you yourself um, will be thankful for is communication. So, and when I say communication, um, it's not, you know, we, might, we take courses in business school that go like um, how to write an email or how to deliver a speech. Um, and those are great skills. Again, uh, please don't think that I'm shortchanging any of those uh, important communication methods. Um, what's, what I mean in terms of communication is how are you able to effectively manage yourself in a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, that's where really your uh, maturity as a professional has uh, shines, I would say. Uh, it's really easy to write a passive aggressive email. It is really easy to write a very nasty, mean, rude email and CC like 10 people on it. Um, and if you wanna be taken seriously as a professional, um, communicating without being passive aggressive is going to take you a long way. Let's just say that. Um, and communication is key because it shows the other person that you are a adult and a professional who can manage their emotions, who can handle their emotions, uh, who can respond in a stressful situation well. Uh, if, you know, you are going to be all over the place, um, that's, it can really go down not in the best way possible really fast. So, you know, take a minute or a moment to really understand how are you communicating with your body language, with your tone, um, with your verbal actions, like, sorry, not verbal, with your hand gestures. Um, so all of this will come under communication. So it's not just, um, you know, letter writing skills or business writing skills or, or presentation skills. Um, it's an everyday, you communicate every day in the workplace uh, and how you communicate um, says and forms a big part of um, your perception as a professional as well. So those are the five things that employers value and look for. Um, you will, if you go to an interview, you'll find that a lot of the times, especially organizations that rely on behavioral interviews or situational interviews, they will touch on all of these. So, you know, you might get a question like, tell us about a time when you failed or when something did not go right, what did you do? Uh, tell us about a time where, you know, you, um, were able to lean into a strength of yours where you really shown and you know where people noticed you or you got a promotion, something like that um, on your resume. So, or, you know, for communication, they might even ask you like, tell, tell us a time when um, there was a difficult conversation that you needed to have uh, with your peer, with your colleague, with your manager. Um, and, you know, what was the outcome of that? How did you handle that? So they're really looking for your emotional maturity uh, in those questions as well. So I hope this, uh, this was helpful. Um, I know it's a lot. It looks like five points, but there's a lot of backstory going behind those. Um, okay. So uh, for those of you who I'll give you a minute to maybe like 30 seconds to go through this meme. Uh, if you're graduating soon or are in the job market, uh, especially as a fresh graduate, uh, it's like, I need a job, but you don't have experience, but I need to get work experience, uh, then work. That's why I'm here, but you need experience. How am I gonna get experience without work? And then answers just work. Um, not very helpful. <laughs> Um, and it's a, it's a circle that, you know, a lot of us find ourselves in, especially after we graduate from college. Um, 
So this might seem like a very dismal situation, um, but there is a way out of it. So hopefully I can help you um, see that with, with the next slide. Um, in terms of my personal experience, this might be true for some of you um, or many of you on the call. Um, the word experience is used as a catch-all for a lot of things. Uh, and if you are a international student, if you are a international professional, um, you can easily hear um, employers say, well, you don't have Canadian work experience or uh, you don't have enough experience. Um, so how do we not choke on, on this term? Uh, the way I like to think about it is, and that I would like to offer you, is expanding our understanding of the word experience. Uh, as somebody who's worked in human resources, as somebody who's, um, who's an international professional in Canada, as somebody who was a fresh graduate, I don't know, 10 years ago, <laughs> um, experience can come in many shapes, sizes, forms, and opportunities. So experience does not always mean your previous work. Um, this is something that I touched on in my last slide as well when I spoke about how do you bridge that gap for your employer. So what I would really like you to think about is when the word experience comes up or when you hear the word experience, um, Let's see. Okay, ask yourself, where have I done something similar before? A lot of us, we read a job description or we read the numbers of years of experience required uh, and we feel we're not qualified to apply for the job. Um, here's a way to reframe that question for you. You may not, you know, you may not meet every single bullet point on a job description to a T, um, but it's an opportunity to think, okay, have I done something similar like this before? And how do the skills, knowledge, or abilities from that work um, translate into this current role that I'm applying for or I want to apply for? This is maybe something that professionals who are already into their careers might use. This is something that a fresh graduate can also use. Um, so think of the times when you've uh, been in a position, maybe in, in school, maybe something that you did in an extracurricular club, uh, maybe something you did uh, as part of a leadership position in a student services body. Um, maybe, some, maybe you worked uh, within the school in an office somewhere um, that you, you know, had an opportunity to uh, engage in this kind of work before, similar to it. It doesn't have to be the exact same. Similar is fine too. Um, have I read about this somewhere? So if you're keen and curious and love to read like me, um, I read a lot. <laughs> um, if you read somewhere and, and you were able to bring that to talk about in a job interview, you know, um, one of the, one thing that a lot of people, especially if they're interviewing, when they go into the job interview, they, th they somehow pressurize themselves by thinking, I need to know everything. The interviewer expects me to know everything. Being realistic is more helpful. Again, I'm not saying you might not have, you might not have a bad interview experience. You might have a bad interview experience, but for and you know, if you if you do have a bad interview experience, you should really ask yourself, do I really want to work here? Um, but for more progressive companies and progressive recruiters, um, you they don't expect you to know everything. They actually, like I mentioned, appreciate if you become curious and you are able to show that you're not a know-it-all, 
that you're actually collaborative, you can use uh, your critical thinking skills on the job to figure out a solution. It's not always about having the solution. What's really valued is can you figure out a solution through teamwork, by reading about it, by learning about it, something, or by getting mentored. So there's, again, like I said, a lot of ways to, to approach a problem, right? Um, yeah, so have you read about this somewhere? Um, and you can even share that, like, you know, this is what I read GM did, or Ford did, or Starbucks did, um, or Samsung did, or I don't know, maybe I did this one time, you know, um, have I, um, you know, can I, can I relate that experience? That is also valid experience. Um, what would I do based on what I know? So all of you are into uh, programs uh, where you've done a certain amount of coursework or even, you know, maybe some of you might have professional work experience or volunteer work experience um, or ad hoc work experience. And all of that experience all of that is also experience. Just because you're not in a corner office, just because you're not working uh, at a company does not mean that is not experience. That is all life experience. Uh, and it is actually really valuable uh, in a job interview because it shows that, you know, a lot of us tend to think, oh, I need to know X, Y, Z to be able to prove that I really know this. The question really to ask yourself is, based on what I know or what I have learned, will this matter? Will this count? Is this applicable to this situation? Um, so that is another question or another way that you can approach experience based on what you already know. Um, another question that you can ask yourself is, where can I get a mentor? Uh, if it's a new area uh, that you're exploring um, and you've not had the opportunity to really dip your feet into the work, uh, like get your hands dirty and really work uh, in that field or that subject, um, find a mentor um, and ask yourselves, like, where can I get a mentor uh, to help me either, you know, score a volunteering position, maybe apprenticeship somewhere, uh, maybe just, you know, have an informational interview or learn from somebody else's experience on the job. Um, again, it's about finding, it's about being creative. It's about finding new ways to um, building your skills, right? It, it does not have to be just one way. I will get a degree, I will step into the corporate workplace and that'll count as experience. You have to be creative. And I think COVID has shown us that we have to be creative in every single way possible. Um, ask yourselves, where can I network? Can I find people within my community? Uh, can I find people outside of my community uh, who can talk about these um, opportunities to me? What does a day uh, in the life of, you know, an HR professional look like? Uh, that is that is experience. It'll show you if you want to be an HR professional or not. It will show you if you want to be a recruiter or not. It will show you if you want to be a designer or not, right? So where can you find the opportunity to network? What can you learn from that experience? Uh, again, where can I volunteer? Have I already volunteered um, to get the required experience? Most importantly, um, would I be willing to learn or try this? This is for somebody who is exploring a completely new area. Um, for example, for me, uh, I'm working on a diversity and inclusion and coaching uh, program for my company. And these are areas where I would like to learn both of these. Uh, and I am, so I'm investing my time and energy into learning or trying this out and, and really, you know, taking imperfect steps and, and really learning on the go. So being involved in the field um, of work or reading about it or hearing from a mentor or job shadowing uh, are all ways to really ask yourself the more important question. Is this what I wanna spend my time on? Is this what I wanna spend, you know, eight hours or nine hours of my day on? 
Um, yeah, and you know, last and not the least, like be a storyteller. You have at least a decade of them. You're in school does not mean that you, like I said, don't have experience. Find ordinary moments from your life, from your school activities, where you can really showcase what the employer is looking for, if, if it's relatable. Were there any new skills that you learned? Were there any new projects that you took on? Uh, were there any leadership opportunities uh, that you were able to tap into? Uh, and what did you do with them? Not just like, yes, I did that, but like what actually happened? Uh, what did you learn from it? And then share that. Uh, everybody likes to hear a good story, trust me. Uh, we would rather hear stories from people uh, and see them really light up because it shows your true passion. When you're telling a story that you enjoy, you will light up. And that's a surefire way for employers to know that you really care about this work or the job that you're applying for. Uh, yeah, so I hope that uh, makes sense for all of you on the call. I'm just gonna quickly check time. Okay, we've still got 15 minutes, wonderful. Last thing that I wanna to touch upon is international experience. So um, I mentioned that I am an immigrant to Canada. I moved here last year. Uh, I heard a lot of people um, as I was into my job search tell me that um, you know my international experience is, is great but employers are looking for Canadian experience. And I was like, that's a bummer. Like I worked all these years and now I don't have Canadian experience. So, you know, what I've shared with you is some of the things that I've done, even though I work in human resource, this is some, these are things that I've personally done to actually get a career in a field that I am passionate about and that I now work in. So with international experience, um, Again, like I said, it's, it's not just about your past experience in another country. If you focus, you, it's good to focus on it, but if you focus on only that as a selling point, uh, it'll be really hard to take a futuristic approach and see how you can bridge the current pain point that an employer in Canada has right now, right? So again, how, what did you do in, you know, your job in another country uh, or, you know, um, somewhere else? And what can you bring from that experience to this position now or in the future for the employer? Uh, what is your international experience now? If you are an international student, um, what are you learning now being an international student? What is that like for you? Um, ask yourself that. It, um, for, for a lot of us, I was an international student in the US and we you know, heard this term like a bazillion times, international student. Uh, the question to really ask ourselves is like, what does this mean for me? Like what, what, what is my experience being in Canada? Um, what am I learning here? What am I learning about the country? What am I learning about the Canadian workplace? What am I learning about the indigenous communities? What am I learning about uh, workplace issues and culture? What am I learning about the diversity and inclusion practices here? Uh, have I had the opportunity to even learn about them? Have I even had an opportunity to think about them? I know coursework keeps you busy. Uh, you've got a ton of quizzes uh, and assignments and projects and whatnot to, to do. But this is a really important piece uh, in the puzzle uh, for you to showcase to your employer that you're not just some international student from another country. Um, you're an international student in Canada who's very much in touch with what's happening in Canada. Uh, and you understand that um, and you can bring that to the workplace. So, you know, if you've had a job in school, for example, um, you know, what, what has from that experience or if you volunteered somewhere or if you've had the opportunity to get a mentor, how has that shaped you and prepared you to work in Canada? 
what are some of the things that you've learned and what are some of the things that you've unlearned? Um, I work uh, at a manufacturing facility and we have about 500 employees who are um, all very diverse. So we've got representation from several different countries. There's five different languages that we speak at the factory. Well, I don't obviously, but people uh, at the factory do. Um, and it's this is what comes in really handy, uh, your international experience when you work at an organization or in an environment where you can really leverage your international experience, not as somebody, uh, you know, who was in Pakistan, but like, what does being with five other cultures uh, and languages under the same roof mean for me? Um, what can I learn uh, from that? What can I bring to the organization uh, from that experience, from being in the work with these people every day? Um, and also, side note, if you think that any of this is easy, it's not. It is uh, definitely a, it's hard work. And if you do find yourself struggling, and if you find yourself uh, wanting more information, it's totally okay to ask. People are more than help, willing to help you. So again, don't think that you have to be a know-it-all. If you don't know something, a better answer is, I'm really interested and curious about this. I would love to get back to you. Let me do some research or let me speak to somebody I know who might have experience with this. People don't want um, or expect you to know it all, especially if you're just starting your career or starting a career in a new country. People are more appreciative if you are willing to admit that you need help. Um, all right, I think this is the last slide. Um, mindset really matters. Doesn't matter if you are a fresh graduate or if you've just started school or you're a seasoned professional who's an international student in Canada and you know are now willing to, uh, or are now going to actually, I should say, um, start a new career here. Uh, there are two types of people in the workplace uh, and in general in life. Um, there are people who make things happen. They're active. They feel very strongly that their skills, abilities, what they do is they have a say in what their future looks like. Uh, and there are people in life who are passive uh, and they let things in life happen to them. Um, and they just, you know, think that there's not much that they can do. This is this is just how it is. This is just how the weather turned out. This is just how Canada is. This is just how my culture is. This is just how, this is just how. Um, grow, I don't know if um, any of you on the call have learned about uh, Carol Dwick and growth mindset. Uh, people who are active are in growth mindset. They want to evolve with their circumstances. Uh, they are not a um, you know, they don't leave life to circumstances or chance. They're, they're actively participating in life. Things will still happen to them. It's not they'll control everything, um, but they're in a better position to respond versus react. So mindset is really important. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, if you have an internal locus of control where you think I make things happen, will serve you a long way um, versus, you know, things happening to you. And with that, if you are, there's, here are some books. Uh, like I mentioned, I read a lot. Uh, these are some books that have helped me in my journey here in Canada. Uh, and also, you know, in, in being a professional and also the way I approach my coaching work. So if you're curious and keen, um, these are some great books. Uh, and there's also an app for those of you who don't like reading. There's an app for that <laughs> called Blinkist. You can get, um, you know, there's uh, business books on there or nonfiction books that you can just get a summary of. So you'll get the Cliff's Notes version um, of what's really important in the book. 
So yeah, give it a try or give two a try, whatever you like. Um, read if you like, if you want to use the app, use that. Um, and yeah, with that, I think that is all what I have to say. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, and again, you can go on Menti and use the code to ask those questions so everybody can benefit from the answer. And again, they're totally anonymous. All right, Ruby, thank you very much. Um, this is a very inspiring uh, lecture they just gave us. I'm really happy with the outcome. I think it's re um, very valuable lessons to all of us, especially as um, undergrads or just freshly graduated students at school. This was really insightful as to how we can uh, conduct ourselves uh, from now on. Uh, from now on. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much for your time. And uh, whoever, if anybody has a question, please feel free, either with the either with the website or, you know, just unmute yourself and ask away. If you're feeling brave, yeah, uh, you, you're welcome to ask your question online. Um, Ruby, this is Pomponia. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I've got a question for our students. Um, a lot of companies use applicant tracking systems. Right. And so I really love, you know, what you talked about in terms of really exploring your, your experience. But some of these um, ATSs, they will kind of block you. So you will not even make it into, you know, into the, into the pool of applicants. Do you have any tips for, for sort of getting past the, an ATS? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, a lot of companies do use ATS. Um, and I can tell you from my personal experience being in Canada and job searching. Um, this is, again, just my personal opinion, personal view. Um, you, your students and anybody who's really applying for a job is going to benefit 10 times more if they take the time and effort to network with people. That's how most jobs happen, even for fresh graduates. Um, unless it's like a program that they're applying for. Uh, if they're applying for a specific program, which is like a management training program or a future leaders program, um, those applications will actually have open-ended questions because those companies are really interested in understanding you as a person. They will not filter you out based on their ATS. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing, if you are applying for a job uh, through the ATS, um, definitely, you know, if you want, use, use the keywords if you wanna get through the machine. There is no guarantee based on my experience. I worked as a recruiter uh, as well for a call center firm. And I can tell you from based on my recruitment experience, um, recruiters, there's like hundreds of applications on the ATS. Recruiters mostly use their instinct and not the ATS um, to hire or, or select profiles because they talk to so many people in a day, they, get really comfortable really quickly with what they're looking for in a candidate. And they can really see that even if, you know, um, they have all these, the ATS is a black hole and it's essentially a backend database that a recruiter will still have. It's not that if you apply through an ATS, your application will, um, will probably be ranked below and not high, but it's not that it won't be in our system. It'll still be in our system. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know if that helps answer your question, um, but if you are really keen on landing a job with let's say Arcteryx, for example, find a person, get your LinkedIn in shape, find a person in Arcteryx to have a coffee with, to send an email to, um, to find a friend who works at some company. Um, and that's how you get into, get your foot in the door, literally.
Only I think we have a comment on on the chat that I will just read. So somebody is saying that apart from working on all the topics you recommended to us, some of us still have challenges of improving our English language. So is there anything you can say to international students who English is your second language and they feel at a disadvantage already because of that? Yes. So um, again, <clears throat> I would um, I work in a factory where I said I, we have five different spoken languages. English is not their primary language. Um, this is a challenge that we face every single day uh, where people are more comfortable um, speaking in their native uh, native languages um, on the uh, you know on the floor. Um, and what we always sort of recommend um, professionals at that stage, is we as a company make it possible for them to learn the language, but there's a bunch of young students here who, who are in school. Um, again, like I said, be creative, be resourceful, look for, uh, I know from personal experience of having immigrated here, there are English language um, conversation circles that happen through Vancouver Public Library if you have access to that. Uh, if you are not a member of the library, please become a member of the library. It's free. Um, there are resources that the library provides that can help you with improving your conversational English language skills. If you are really keen on improving it, um, use it, use the old fashioned way that a lot of people uh, use, like watch a lot of, um, you know, programs to incre increase your listening abilities. Uh, find a friend who would be able to, who you know has better conversational abilities. Um, as international students, uh, and again, this is not wrong or this is not something that I'm um, saying is not right. Uh, what, because you're all students, I would really encourage you to get out of your comfort zone. It's great to have friends from your culture. It's great to be able to speak your language. It's great to be able to understood uh, where you might not find a similar word in the English language for it. But if you're preparing to work in Canada long term, if you're preparing to enter a Canadian job market, uh, try and find resources in friends, TV, people, newsletters, Vancouver um, services. Um, there are, you know, um, a lot of um, organizations that specialize in helping um, newcomers or non-native English speakers improve their English language skills. See if you can get in touch with them. Um, see if they, if they are not able to help you, they might actually refer you to a resource that could uh, help you. Be resourceful, bottom line. Be resourceful, think outside the box, be creative. Okay, I see a question. Um, I hope that helps answer by the way, before I move on. Um, okay. Is our organization welcomes all applicants? I mean, do they look on age, race, et cetera? No, it's discriminatory in Canada to um, do that. They can't <laughs> discriminate. Um, any, oh, I see five questions. Let's see, uh, there's number one. How do you deal with a panel interview? It seems very intimidating. How do you get the interviews to listen to you? How do you control the environment? Mm. Again, very interesting question. Thank you for whoever asked it. Um, it can be intimidating, especially if you know you have not had a panel interview. Um, what I like to offer um, as reasonable counsel is the people who are interviewing you, again, you, from what I'm reading from your um, question, you're feeling very pressured, like you have to control the environment. Um, the interviewers are people like you. Uh, they are not 
they have nothing against you. They're not out there to get you. Um, they care about you as a person. If they've invited you to a panel interview, a panel interview is usually not the first step. The first step is a phone screen uh, with a recruiter. If the recruiter feels you're strong enough, then they will invite you to a panel interview with uh, you know, two managers or three managers. So if you've made it that far, uh, rely on your strengths as a professional, as you know, to, to showcase yourself. You're not there to control the environment. It's not your job. <laughs> um, you are, you know, there might be a question again that they might ask you. Uh, don't feel pressured to know it all. If you don't know the answer to something, just be honest. Say, I'm sorry, I don't know this, but I am willing to look it up for you. That's the attitude that the panel is looking for. They're not looking for your uh, perfect answer. If you have that, excellent, use it. Uh, if you don't, just say it. Just be honest. Don't, please don't make up answers. People can see through that. <laughs> How do you get the interviews to listen to you? Um, I'm not sure what your experience has been in the past. Um, if you feel they're interrupting you, um, you can, again, that is also um, for you to really showcase your maturity as a professional. If you find that somebody is interrupting you, uh, it is totally okay to say to them, Hey, I noticed that you know um, I was I, I didn't get a chance to finish my sentence. Uh, can I have the opportunity to please finish my sentence? You don't have to be like, you know, please let me talk, or you don't have to get nervous about it. You just have to politely ask them, can I please get an opportunity to finish my sentence? Or you know, if they are jumping ahead of you, uh, you can say you can bridge the gap by saying. Uh, well, I'm so glad to that you have this question. I was just going to address this, and then you can jump on to addressing that question, uh, you know, or whatever they want to know. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Um, Ruby. Yes. I'm speaking through student services. Um, oh, hi. My computer just shut off there, so I had to run here to Abia's office. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask you if you could please uh, maybe provide your email to students. Yes. So we can finish off those answers over email maybe. Uh, yeah. Just because our workshop would go from one to two and I'm sure you yeah. have lots to do today. Uh, so maybe. Uh, yeah, totally. So let's see. Um, yep. I'll quickly. Hmm. Can't seem to move the. I'll just stop the screen share for a bit and then reshare it with the um, slide that has my information on it. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, so if you have any, um, you know, professional inquiries, here's my email address, feel free to write to me. Um, if you have any questions about my coaching, you can write to me um, on another separate email address. Um, yeah, and I hope this was helpful, enjoyable um, for all of you who took the time to join us today. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, happy to answer questions um and send them over to you anna hopefully yes uh thank you thank you so much for your time this was really valuable for everybody um and i wish everybody a a, a good return to their class because we have a class that's going back to studying now thank you <laughs> thank you so much ruby thank you everybody. yeah thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you thank you Thank you.